Okay, this video is going to be over 7.2, which is the right triangle trigonometry. So let me um, share my screen so you can see my paper, and then I will share my screen. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, there we go. Okay, so here we have the section 7.2, which is right triangle trigonometry. And in this section, we'll establish a bunch of different theorems. However, I promise you that's not even a fraction of the ones that we're going to learn throughout the entire semester. There are gobs and gobs and gobs of trigonometric theorem, um, properties, theorems, identities, uh, formulas. I mean, there's just a lot, okay? Um, but chapter seven is going to cover that. And so little by little, we're gonna learn more and more about these trigonomic functions, okay? So the word trigonometry comes from the Greek word trigon, meaning it's trigonon, which means triangle, and the Greek word metron, which means measure. So it's basically the measurements of a triangle. And that is exactly where we got um, trigonometry from, it's from triangles. So it says, let theta be an acute angle. An acute means less than 90 degrees in a right triangle. The words sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, and cotangent describe the relationship between the angle and the ratio of the following sides. This relationship describes a function, okay? So here you've got the acute angle. This is less than 90 degrees. That together with it will make 90 degrees. And then that 90 degrees will make the whole triangle 180 degrees, right? And then you've got some sides here. So here's the angle. This is the side opposite of that angle. This is the side adjacent to that angle. And then this is, because it's across from the right angle, this is called the hypotenuse. Okay, so according to that triangle above, if I want to establish the trigonometric identities, sine of theta is defined as the opposite over the hypotenuse in this triangle. So in that case, it would be B over C. And then cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, which would be A over C. Tangent is opposite over adjacent, so B over A. Cosecant is hypotenuse over opposite, so C over B. Then secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. Cotangent is going to be adjacent over opposite. So we've got all of our relationships here. Now, just as in 7.1, I went ahead and wrote little notations for problems that were similar to the examples. Um, and then of course, I've got some extras that um, I didn't find anything that was quite like it, just slightly a little bit different. Um, and so then I went ahead and wrote those down. Now, here we have um, example one. So it says, find the values of trigonometric functions um, of the angle theta, given that the side adjacent the angle has length of 12, and the side opposite the angle has a length of 5. A, label the sides of the rectangle with the given information. So here's my angle, and it said the side that is adjacent, which would be this side, is going to be 12. And the side opposite, which is this side, is going to be of length five. Um, part B says, use the Pythagorean theorem to find the length of the unknown side. Well, the unknown side is the hypotenuse. So I know that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And so far, I know that A is 12. I know that B is five, but I do not know C. So we get 144 plus 25, which is 169. And if I take the square root of both sides, 
I will end up with 13 equal to C. So now I know that the unknown side is 13. It says use the definition above to describe the value of each of the trigonomic functions. So we know sine of theta is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So the opposite, and I'm just going to write this, opposite over hypotenuse, which in our case is 5 over 13. Cosine is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse, which in this case is 12 over 13. Tangent is going to be um, opposite over adjacent, which is 5 over 12. We've got cosecant, which is hypotenuse over opposite. And that would be 13 over 5. We've got secant, which is the hypotenuse over the adjacent. And in this triangle, it is 13 over 12. And finally, cotangent, which is adjacent over the opposite, which is 12 over 5. Now, the next page says, identify which ratios are reciprocals of one another. And so you see opposite over hypotenuse, hypotenuse over opposite. So that would be sine and cosecant. And then you have cosine and secant. They're also um, reciprocals of each other. And then tangent and cotangent. And so that creates um, a reciprocal identity. So cosecant is the same as one over sine and vice versa. Sine is also one over cosecant. Secant is one over cosine and the reverse is also true. Cosine is the same as one over secant. Oh, that is messy. Let's see, fix that. And then cotangent is 1 over tangent, or vice versa, tangent is 1 over cotangent. They are reciprocals of each other. They don't just go in one direction, it goes both ways, okay? And then, of course, you have your quotient identities, which means these two functions are comprised of um, two of the other functions. So tangent can actually be found by taking sine over cosine, okay? So you don't even necessarily need to know what tangent is. Um, if you know what sine and cosine is, you can find tangent. Now, example two says, given that sine equals the square root of 10 over 10 and cosine of an angle equals three square root of 10 over 10, find the value of the remaining four trigonomic functions. So if I set up my triangle and put my theta there, Remember, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So in either case, the hypotenuse is 10, and then the opposite is supposed to be the square root of 10, and the adjacent is going to be 3 square root of 10. Um, Checking one thing real quick. Okay, good. Um, so now we're going to find the other four. So we've already got sine and cosine. Um, actually, don't even need to do the triangle at all. I mean, I could, but I could just use these identities to figure that out because um, if I already know sine, I know that cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So that would be 10 over square root of 10. And if I rationalize my denominator, I get 10 square root of 10 over 10, which is just square root of 10. Then if I want to find secant, I know that that's the reciprocal of cosine. So it would be 10 over 3 square root of 10. Again, we would rationalize our denominator. 
So we get 10 square root of 10 over three times 10. These would cancel and we'd get square root of 10 over three. If we want to know tangent, we would just take sine over cosine. And that's the same as saying 10 over 10 times 10 over three square root of 10. So the square root of 10s cancel, the 10s cancel, you end up with an invisible one, which is now visible over three. And then the cotangent is going to be the reciprocal of that, which is three over one or just three. Couldn't see this here. So here I did the sine value over the cosine. And instead of saying the top divided by the bottom, I did the top times the reciprocal of the bottom, right? That's the property for dividing fractions. And so then the tens reduce, the square root of tens reduce, and I just ended up with like an imaginary one that was here in the front. Now it's visible over here because it's the only thing in the numerator. And then the three that's left over in the denominator carries over. And then cotangent is just the reciprocal of tangent. So three over one, which can be simplified to just three. Now, the last thing says using the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equal to c squared, a new identity can be established that will prove to be useful considering the following. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So if I divide every single term by c squared, we get a squared over c squared, which can be rewritten as a over c, the whole thing squared. Then you have this term, b squared over c squared, which can also be rewritten as the uh, b over c, the whole thing squared. And then c squared over c squared is just one. Now, A over C in this situation um, or I'm sorry, this is A and this is B is adjacent over hypotenuse, which is cosine, and B over C is opposite over hypotenuse, which is sine. So then if you use the commutative property, you can, instead of plus cosine squared plus sine squared, you can write it as sine squared plus cosine squared equal to one. And with trigonometry, we usually put the square after the trig function and then the argument afterwards. So this is the way you write trig functions with a square or a cube or a fourth power, any power. You put it before the angle. Um, and that's all this is mentioning as well. Now it says this last line, sine squared plus cosine squared equal to one is called the Pythagorean identity. Now you can use that Pythagorean identity to come up with two more Pythagorean identities. So if I were to take this thing and divide it by sine squared theta, sine squared theta, sine squared theta, I end up with one plus um, cosine theta over sine theta squared equal to um, the reciprocal or one over sine theta squared. And then sine over cosine is cotangent. And one over sine is cosecant. And then remember, we can rewrite this cotangent squared as cotangent squared theta, and we can write cosecant theta squared as cosecant squared theta. Um, so then this establishes a new identity between cotangents and cosecant. Mm, you could also solve for one, right? If you minus cotangent squared on both sides, it will cancel it from this side, and now you will have cosecant squared minus cotangent squared. This information might help you a little bit with number four, okay? Um, and the same thing over here, if I decided instead to divide everybody by cosine squared, I would end up with sine theta over cosine theta squared plus 
Oh, cosine squared over cosine squared is just one. And then I would end up with one over cosine theta squared. Sine squared, sine over cosine is tangent. And one over cosine is secant. And then this can be rewritten as tan squared theta plus one and secant squared theta. And again, you could always solve for, you could solve for any of them. So even though it's written like this and we know what secant squared equals, we could also minus one and then we would know what tan squared equals. So you can manipulate um, that theorem so that it suits you as you're trying to um, manipulate some expressions later on in the section. Now, example three says, find the exact value of each expression, do not use a calculator. So I'm gonna use the properties and the identities that I know so far. So for this one, I know that cosecant um, squared is the same as, I can rewrite this as cosecant of 35 degrees, the whole thing squared. Because that squared and one squared is equal to one. And then I know that one over cosecant is the same as sine of 35 degrees by the reciprocal property. And if I rewrite this, it could be sine squared of 35 degrees. And then I'm just gonna bring this down because I haven't done anything with it. And so then I can use the Pythagorean identity that sine squared of any angle plus cosine squared of that same angle is gonna equal one. So this comes out to just be one. Okay, so sine squared theta or sine squared 35 degrees, cosine squared 35 degrees, as long as these are the same, they're both square and there's a plus in the middle, we can use that identity and get one. Now here, what I'm gonna do is use the idea of the quotient, um, the quotient identity. So cotangent is equal to cosine over sine. So this fraction itself is cotangent of pi over three. And if I'm minusing the same exact thing, then I'm going to end up with the value zero. Now example four kind of got chopped off here. So those, um, that label does go with this problem. So it says find the values of the remaining trigonomic function given only one of the values. So before I was given two and I was able to use all the reciprocals and the quotient identities to figure out the other ones. This one, I won't be able to do that, at least not at the beginning because I only have one um, value. So in this case, I will definitely need to have that triangle that I was trying to build in the previous example. So if I have the triangle here, and here's my angle. Remember, sine is going to be the opposite over the hypotenuse. So that means my opposite side is two. My hypotenuse is going to be five, but I don't know what this adjacent side is. But I can use my um, Pythagorean theorem to figure out what that side is. So this one is usually called um, B. So I know a squared plus two squared, and then the hypotenuse is the C. So I get a squared plus four equal to 25. Um, if I minus four on both sides, I get 21. So I get that a is the square root of 21. So I'm just gonna write the square root of 21. Sometimes they simplify, sometimes they don't. But if I type square root of 21 in my calculator, it doesn't simplify at all. Okay, so it's gonna stay like that. And then now we have, um, let's see. Now we have everything we need because if I wanna find, I already have sine, if I wanna find cosine, I'm gonna be doing the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which is going to be the square root of 21 over five. If I want to know tangent, that is going to be the opposite over the adjacent. So in this case, it's going to be 2 over the square root of 21. I do have to rationalize. 
So I get 2 squared to 21 over 21. Then we need cosecant. which is going to be the hypotenuse over the opposite. So five over two, then we have secant, which is the hypotenuse over the adjacent. So we have five over square root of 21, which does need to be rationalized. So the answer there is five square root of 21 over 21. And then finally, cotangent, which is going to be the adjacent over the opposite. So we get square root of 21 over two. And that is all for our trigonometric identity. Now, here there's one thing that we need to remember. Um, you have a 90 degree angle, and we know that the angles of a triangle sum up to equal 180 which means that these two together would have to equal 180, okay? Oh, before I continue, so if you already have 90 taken care of, then these two would have to equal 90, actually, okay? And when two angles, acute angles, sum up to equal 90, they're called complementary angles. But I wanted to explain something over here first. When we were doing opposites, all of that, we were given numbers or we were given given letters here, here, and here. If you are not given letters here, here, and here, but still expected to do opposite over a hypotenuse and all of that, remember that the length of this measurement can be written as AC, since it's the length between A and C. This measurement here can be written as BC, because that's the length of between B and C. And this measurement can be written as AB, with, because it's the links between A and B. Sometimes people choose the bar and sometimes people write it without the bar. But basically, if you put them together, it means the length of that side between those two vertices, okay? Each one of these ends is called the vertice. So for instance, if I wanted to find sine of theta, it would be the opposite, which is BC over the hypotenuse, which is AC in this case. And that's going to be necessary to know to complete number six in the homework assignment, okay? Because they're not going to have the little, little variables here. They're going to have just the general vertices without the signs being written down at all. So hopefully that helps. Um, it reminded me here because I saw the vertices A and B, and that made me, um, those angles remain, made me remember of that one example. So we're talking about complementary angles here now. And so if I try to find sine of B, so I'm going to pretend that this is my theta. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So the opposite would be little b and the hypotenuse would be C. Same thing, cosine of B. So B is my angle and cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So A over C. Here though, A is my angle. So now I need to look at this compared to A. So when I do opposite over hypotenuse, little a is my opposite, but C is still in my hypotenuse. So A over C. And then cosine of A means the adjacent side, which is B, over the hypotenuse, which is C. So if you notice, the sine of B is B over C, but the cosine of A is also B over C. And similarly, the cosine of B is A over C, and the sine of A is A over C, okay? So these are our equivalent here. And that is because sine and cosine are what we call co-functions. Um, similarly, there's a relationship between tangent and cotangent, and then there's a relation, similar relationship between secant and cosecant, okay? Um, that's where this word co comes from, from complementary, okay? So sine and then its complement is cosine. And then tangent and its complement is cotangent. And then secant and its complement are going to be cosecant, okay? Um, 
Why are these equivalence ratio? What is the relationship between angle A and angle B? It is because the angles are complementary. Angles or sum up to equal, it should actually be 90 degrees. Right, this was important, okay? Um, so here's the relationships and they do go in both the directions. So whatever theta is, if you take the complement of that angle, the cosine of that complementary angle will be the same value as sine of the original angle. And you can do it in degrees or you can write it in, in radians. It just depends on how they give you the angle, whether they give you the angle in degrees or they give you the angle in radians, okay? And it does go vice versa. So the cosine of theta is also the sine of its complement, okay? And similarly for tangent and cotangent and then secant and cosecant, okay? So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, another six um, identities there that you can use. So let's look at this problem here. Example, it says, um, use the complementary angle theorem. So all they want me to do is write what it would be equivalent to. They don't want me to evaluate it just to write what it's equal to. So that means it would be cosine of 90 degrees minus 35 degrees, which is the cosine of, I don't know, my brain's already tired for the day, 55 degrees. And then tangent, since that's in radians, that would be cotangent of pi over two minus pi over three. And so then I get, and I'm going to cheat, I'm going to do pi over 2 minus pi over 3, and I think this calculator does simplify it for me. So it gets the common denominators and adds it all up and then simplifies the fraction for me. This one is also in radians, so secant and cosecant, and it would be pi over 2 minus pi over 12. And so then let me type that in there, pi over 2, take away pi over 12. And I get 5 pi over 12, okay? So then in this case, um, all it means is that this problem can be done just using the complementary angle, okay? Now this section is going to be a little bit harder because there's different scenarios. I mean, there's a bunch of different combinations of all the theorems and identities that we've learned so far so many combinations of them. There's no way I could cover all of them. So you're really gonna have to put your thinking cap on on these particular problems because they are all over the place. And so they do require you to really think and try to play around with these identities. And the whole goal is for you to learn to play around with them. Um, because as more and more identities get introduced, your brain is really going to have to cycle through all of the identities. And I say all really long because there's a whole bunch of them. Um, you're going to have to learn how to be able to pick the ones that are convenient for you to be able to solve the problem. Okay. So you really have to just start early now playing with them and recognizing the relationships um, and being able to knock this stuff out. So I really want you to practice these. I'm not gonna go over every single one because even these problems themselves switch up when you get one wrong and it regenerates another problem for you, like a similar exercise or similar question. So there's no way I could possibly go over all of the iterations of these examples. So I'm just gonna cover the two that I have here and then I did use one because it was a little bit different. Um, and I think I had one more over here that I saw that was different. So other than that, I'm gonna cover these and then we'll jump into the extra problems that I selected from the homework assignment. So here I have tangent of 75 and cotangent of 15. And I know that those two are complementary angles of each other, right? Because 75 degrees plus 15 degrees equals 90 degrees. So to me, that sticks out to me that I want to use my complementary angle theorem. So that means it doesn't matter which one I do, I'm just going to use the top. So the complement of tangent is cotangent, and then um, 90 minus 75 would actually be the cotangent of 15 degrees. 
and my denominator is cotangent of 15 degrees. So that means that will reduce down to a nice one. Now here again, I also noticed that 38 and 52 add up to equal 90. So those two are also complementary um, angles. So I'm gonna use the complement of cosine, which is sine, and then 90 minus 38. is going to be sine of 52 degrees minus sine of 52 degrees, which happens to be subtracting itself. And what happens when we do that? We end up with zero. Um, okay, so let's move on to some of the problems that we have here. So it says use the definition or identities to find the exact value of each remaining five trigonometric functions of the acute angle. So this one um, is a lot like the problem we did with sine, I think it was two-fifths. So we have to remember what secant represents. Secant represents, um, what is it? It is hypotenuse over adjacent. And then nine can be rewritten as nine over one, which means the hypotenuse is nine units and then the adjacent is one unit. And if I want to figure out what the opposite is, that means I need one squared plus that side squared, whatever it is, equal to nine squared. And if I minus one on both sides, I get 80. And if I take the square root on both sides, I don't know what that simplifies down to. Simplifies down to four square root of five. So that means this side is four square root of five units. So then now I can find a rest. So sine of theta is gonna be opposite over hypotenuse, which is gonna be four square root of five over nine. Cosine theta is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse, which is going to be one over nine. Tangent is going to be opposite over adjacent, which is going to be four square root of five over one. Then we have cosecant theta, which is hypotenuse over opposite. So nine over four square root of five, but we do have to rationalize that. So we get nine square root of five over four times five, or nine square root of five over 20. And then the last one, cotangent of theta, which is um, adjacent over opposite. So the adjacent over the opposite. And again, we have to rationalize that denominator. So we get square root of five over four times five, which is the square root of five over 20. And we have found all five of the trigonomic values. Okay, so here's another one that says use the fundamental identities and or the complementary angle theorem. Okay, so we have choices here. So I do know this that 78 and 12 are complementary angles. So I'm going to change this one. So cosine and sine, right? And I'm going to keep that. Essentially, what's happening here is this is can be written as cosine of 78 degrees squared, right? And this and the inside of the parentheses can be written as sine of 12 degrees. 90 take away 78 is 12. And then this can be rewritten as sine squared of 12 degrees. But ultimately you could go from here to here without having to have all of those middle steps. It's just applying one identity, and that is the complementary identity. Then I notice that I have sine squared and cosine squared, but I don't have a plus sign here. So I'm going to factor out the negative from both of these terms. So this will be positive sine squared, positive cosine squared. And if you're not sure if you factored it correctly, distribute it and see if you get the same two terms. And I will, a negative times a positive is a negative, 
negative times a positive is a negative. And then you'll notice sine squared of an angle plus cosine squared of an angle. Well, we know that that's the trick, the Pythagorean identity, and it equals one. So one take away this weird one gives me zero. Now, here we have number 16. It says, given that tangent of theta equals 14, use the trigonomic identities to find the exact value of each of the following, okay? And so here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a lot of different strategies, like for secant squared. I know that there's a theorem that can relate, it's the Pythagorean identity that relates secant squared with tangent squared. So that theorem is tangent squared theta plus one equals secant squared theta. So if I'm trying to find secant squared theta, all I need to do is find this value. Well, remember what this represents. It represents tangent of theta squared plus one. And I know what tangent of theta is. I know that it's 14. And 14 squared is 196. And if I add one, I get 197. So that is the answer for part A. For part B, we know that cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. And since I know the value of tangent is 14, that means that cotangent is 1 over 14. We also know that tangent and cotangent are cofunctions. So we know that this is equivalent to tangent of just theta. And I know what tangent of just theta is, it's 14. Tangent of theta is 14. And then the last one is cosecant squared. This one's gonna be a bit more tricky. I don't know any relationship between cosecant squared and tangent exactly. But I do know that there's a relationship between cosecant squared and cotangent. So I know that cosecant squared actually equals one plus cotangent squared. And then I know that this can be written as cotangent of theta squared. And then I know that this can be rewritten as the reciprocal one over tangent theta still squared. And I know what tangent is. It's 14. So I end up with 1 plus 1 over 196. If I get a common denominator, I end up with 197 over 196. So I wanted to go over that one, especially that one, because we had to use two of them um, to put it together. Okay. Now, I'm not going to do the lengthy word problem. It looks crazy, number 18, but it's really not that bad. It's literally a problem like this one. It's a problem like this, um, or actually more so, it's probably a problem like, let me see. Yes, it's going to be a problem like example one. So 7.2 number 18 is going to be a lot like this, where you're going to be given two sides, you find a third, and then you find the trigonomic function or the specific trigonomic function that it asks you for. The only thing is, is that it's a super lengthy word problem. Okay, so you've got to decipher, use the triangle they gave you, the values they gave you, and then just go from there. Um, you really can pick apart the problem if you try not to focus so much on all the words, just picture and then the numbers they give you and you can make it out. Um, it helps to understand the scenario as well. So when you're doing that problem, the numbers are large. And so when you try to simplify your Pythagorean theorem, you're going to end up with the square root of really large numbers. So I just wanted to kind of go over like this review, how to do the square root of that. Because if I try to do that in my calculator, eight, four, eight, one, two, three, four, it gives me a decimal. But the problem in my math lab wants the exact answer. And so it's not going to accept this. So what you need to do is you need to rewrite this 
and kind of make a factor tree. So I see a bunch of zeros. So I know 100 is definitely going to go into that. So 8, 4, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, divided by 100, I get 8, 4, 8, 0, 0. Well, I know another perfect, well, I don't think 100 will go into that again, but I do want to use perfect squares. So let me divide by 100, I get 8, 4, 8. Um, I'm not sure what other, per, I know 4 goes into that, and that's a perfect square. So divide by 4, I get 2, 12. Um, I'm not sure if 4 goes into that again. Oh, it does. So 4 times 53, and 53 is a prime number, so I cannot split that up. Um, so then what I end up getting is um, 100 times 100 times 4 times 4 times 53. And if you're not sure, multiply it all together just to make sure that your tree, that you did it correctly. So if I multiply all those in my calculator, I do get that 8480000. Then when you take the square root of 100 times the square root of 100 times the square root of 4 times the square root of 4 times the square root of 53, you get 10 times 10 times 2 times 2 times, and there is no square root of 53 because 53 is prime. If you don't believe me, do the square root of 53 in your calculator and it'll just stay square root of 53. But 10 times 10 is 100, 100 times 2 is 200, 200 times 2 is 400. So I have simplified this big radical into this simpler radical, but it's still the exact answer and not that decimal point that, that the calculator was initially giving us. So I just wanted you to have um, that example. Now I think we talked in about an hour and a half in the first video, plus about an hour in the second video, and about 45 minutes in this video. So together, that's like 3.25 hours. Now, typically in a regular face-to-face -face class, we would be spending um, 50 divided by 60. We would be spending 1.5 8333 in each class period times two class periods per week, so about 3.6 hours in lecture. And so, so far, I've been able to do this whole week's lectures in 3.25 um, hours. So it's starting to coincide. So you see how I've selected the um, sections and how many we're going to cover each week and all of that. Um, it really should kind of sort of coincide with if we were to have lectures for that week, what would I be able to cover? Um, but as far as 7.2, we're done. Take this information, try to do the problems. If you get stuck, um, you can always text me, remind, send me a picture of the problem you're working on, send me a picture of the work you've done, and then we'll talk about it from there. But that's it for now.